How long were you in the school before you had your first match? I want to jump into your WCW career and get moving here. First match was probably eight months, and it was live on the Clash of Champions. It was me and my my partner, Corey Pendarvis, versus Brad Armstrong and Tim Warner. Okay, so you got that first match, and what did you wrestle that first match under? I was a uh, Master Blaster Steel out of Fuchsia Mohawk. Well, let's talk about Master Blaster Steel. What was the mindset on creating that character? Did someone just say, hey, Kevin, you're a big motherfucker. Let's put a mohawk on you and call you Master Blaster Steel. Did you go home and think, hey, man, let me put this behind this thing. Here's the look. How did that all evolve? Well, the thing was, was, you know, it was uh, only was the, was the booker at the time. And only was the one I had the meeting with. And I went to uh, the Cop County Civic Center met him. And he, you know, looked at me, and I, you know, my hair was long. I had long brown hair, and uh, had that like Magnum P, you know, the Magnum PI mustache. And uh, he said, "You know, yeah, I'm thinking about uh, the Mohawk." And I'm thinking, and then they offered me, you know, seventy-five grand for my contract. And I was thinking, "Fuck, so I'm gonna cut my hair off and take a pay cut to go do this shit." And I'm like, "God," I said, "I was too sure about doing it." And then I talked to my wife. She said, you know, it's time for you to get out of that strip club, you know, because we've had some problems there. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you know that you're going to get, you're gonna get you know, shot or stabbed or something in one of those deals. So she, my wife wanted me to get out of that shit, not knowing that I'd be leaving one pirate ship to get out of a fucking worse one. So uh, I just, you know, I, I said, fuck it, and went and got my hair done. And then I was supposed to look like the dude from the, 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 the Mad Max movie, that had the motorcycle that had the red mohawk. He had the little boy, the little bitch on the back. Yeah, I had the fucking open ass cheeks on the back of his leather. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, that. I was supposed to look like that guy. That right. was the look they were looking for. So I, they wanted me to mimic that look. So that's kind of where that whole, you know, thing came from. And you know, I went and had it had, had it done, and you know, came home, and you know, my wife looked at me like, "What the fuck?" And once again, like looking back at it, just a rip. You know, take a decent looking guy and make him look like a fucking asshole. How long were you the Master Blaster before they uh, changed you up and switched you into the Oz gimmick? We had the, the Clash of Champions, and then we went on the road. And I was on the road for five days, came back, and what, no, the last day there we were supposed to wrestle in Hammond, Indiana. And my, my part, I got up that morning, my, the, the guy that was my tag team partner just took off, went home. He wigged out. Just, yeah, just can't, you know, just couldn't do it. So now I think I go to Hammond and I, I, I uh, drive with Dutch and uh, Sid and I got no partner. So I can look there at Grizz, uh, opening match with Al Green versus somebody. I don't know who it was. And Al Green, they walked over and grabbed Alan and said, you're going you're gonna to wrestle with this kid in a, in a tag, this guy. So, you know, we had, uh, shook hands and went out there and you know, I was a, a much better hand than the guy that was with that that I had. You right. Know, Al had been around a couple of years, so at least I had so the other guy was the fucking drizzle of shits. I mean, they told me when they you know, when they brought him in that this guy would, you know, be able to, you know, work the match and he just come in on the heat until you, you know, you weren't so green. Well, we get to down the first night and to go over the match with Armstrong and Horner and, and Jerry's just taking take an arm and the fucking the guy my partner didn't even know how to take an arm and I'm like Jesus man we're, we're fucked so push forward uh, me and Al so I think we got a, a win at Halloween Havoc against uh, I forget what they were called but it was uh, Armstrong and Smothers and they gave it the Southern Boys or something like that yeah Southern Boys something like that yeah Southern Boys so we got a win we, we got a win over them in Chicago at Halloween Havoc so we were kind of getting a little bit of a push till we went in Christmas time and had a two segment match at center stage with the Steiners. And they were going to beat Al in the second segment uh, with the bull, with uh, the bulldog, bulldog off the top with Robbie's finish. And uh, we're, in the, we're in the room, and uh, Al says, ah, I think it's too, a little too soon to be beating us. And they asked me to excuse myself, but I left and was about. Two minutes later, out came out and was shaking his head and went into the room and grabbed his bag and he was gone. <laughs> so you're all by yourself again. Yeah, watch him go over and fucking erase the erase the match to the fucking board. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I said, God, yeah. and it was like a Moloch. 
they looked at me and fucking said, throw your shit out. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm sensing we got a uh, I'm sensing we have a repackage here with Oz, and before we get to that, I'm gonna take care of a little bit more business. All right, coming back in, talking to Kevin Nash about the character change from Master Blaster, quickly segueing into Oz and talk a little bit about Benny Vegas, and we're gonna start talking to the ins and outs of the business and some heavy duty shit here. Uh, Master Blaster short lived. Here comes Oz. I remember. Seeing the pay-per-view when you debuted, you came out there, I mean, with with that outfit on, you was about eight feet tall, and you had this wicked goddamn mask on, you pulled it off, and you had your eyes wide open, and I was thinking, man, what the fuck is going on here? What were you thinking when you made that debut? Well, I mean, they didn't see the outfit or nothing until the day of, and they hand me this fucking deal, and it's just like, holy fuck, like another rib. I'm in a lime green outfit with a cape that weighs 200 fucking pounds. And they got a, I'm, I'm not only wearing a dunce cap, but I'm wearing a dunce cap with a rubber mask. And I'm going to pull an old man's face off and be me underneath it. Like, it, it, it I think it, be, be, maybe Minotaur might have been, been the only thing that was even worse than that. I mean, just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, from the I'm side. looking at that. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that motherfucking outfit going. I eat well, I, like once again, you know. I, back then, it was you know how it was, man. Fucking they didn't want anybody to play. They wanted everybody to quit. But the rib was. I mean, when you got out on the road, you didn't have like a travel kit and maybe just you know just wear the green shit. It was a big. It was like a big five by five crate. I remember it. Oh. It was brutal. Oh. And then I drag a fucking, uh, uh, there was a rubber made fucking thing, and I had a fucking bad lock on it. And, you know, I mean, it, it, the fucking thing must have weighed 75 pounds. That was just my gear, let alone fucking, you know, my, you know, my, 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 my clothes and shit. This was, there weren't more wheels on shit back then. Well, you know, there, there wasn't wheels back in, and, and why didn't that invention come around a little bit sooner? Because it could have saved you a ton of goddamn energy. You you move into from that you end of Vinny Vegas and I actually enjoyed Vinny Vegas. It was kind of a, a, a piece of who and what you are. You're a funny cat, right? Take a lot of shit serious, but you don't give a shit about a lot of stuff. You're kind of an endearing uh, character. How how was your time as Vinny Vegas? I liked it because I mean, like that was the first time that I had any any input into what I was going to be, and I got a chance to talk and I got a chance to be a jack off and you know, I got a chance to have some fun. You know, during this time is when uh, the whole time Jim Ross was like the only guy that was kind of on my team. Right. And Jim would always, Jim, Jim was doing a, a wrestling radio show out of Atlanta. He'd do it on Sundays. And I, I was like a frequent guest in his because like he, he was one of the few people that would sit around and then actually listen to me and say, well, shit, this guy's smart and he's funny and I'll put him on the radio. Jim was always an advocate for me. I mean, he was the one guy I always had in my corner. Right. And, uh, which was a good guy to have. And, you know, I mean, yeah, he's one of the few stand up fuckers that, you know, in the business, you know. And, you know, you liked it. You liked the character. And so, so Shawn Michaels, you know, Michaels would, I guess, would, would, would saw me a couple of times. He called Robbie Steiner, said, Do you think Nash can you out of his contract? I'd like to be my bodyguard. Because nobody was selling for Shawn in the WWF. And, uh, just jump to it, man. Like, you know, I, I got a phone call from Robbie there in Green Bay, and he said, hey, can you get out of your contract? I said, fuck yeah, I'll get out of it somehow. And I just drove the next set of TVs. I drove with Wyndham to uh, Dalton TVs and uh, just looked out the window the whole time and didn't say a word, just, you know, tried to do the work. And he bit it and said, man, you're out yourself. What's up? I said, my wife says she's going to leave me if I don't get out of business. And he said, well, fuck, man, what are you going to do? I said, I got to get out of business. He said, we'll talk to Oli. Went and talked to Ole, uh, the WCW offices, or he had the offer to come to the WWF, sat right there, uh, got a, a release from a contract from Ole, walked right over, walked the fax machine, faxed that son of a bitch to Titan Tower, to JJ, and I was in Albany, Georgia, or Albany, uh, New York, three nights later helping Shawn Michaels screw Marty Giannetti to get the Intercontinental belt and on we're all on the next Monday. Well, you know, before you left uh, WWF, and I was all on the kayfabe on the down low, but you and I started traveling together and struck up a good fellowship, oh, yeah. and we had some goddamn interesting times on the road. 
uh, times were tough back then. We were making decent coin, but we certainly weren't making top dollar. And I just come from, you know, making 15 to 20 bucks a, a night, you know, down in USWA, hooked up down there. And you know the deal when you walked into WCW, you was already making some okay money. But because you and me are, are the people that we were and still are, we stayed, we, we made it a point to stay at the biggest shitbox hotels we could find as a rip to ourselves. One time we stayed in a little room. And it was, uh, that, remember that one door that didn't uh, meet at the top? There's about a two, three-inch gap because the door was too small on the hinges. You remember standing that so much? Yeah. Uh, we stayed in some of the, remember, remember the one place we stayed in, it was like, um, that's where it was called the Christmas tree inn or something like that. But we always, like, the, the, the funny thing was, we, we, you know, we're notorious that, you know, people probably don't, realize this but as a professional wrestler you know there's there's no towels provided so when you work if you're on the road you just gotta take the hotel from the uh, right uh, towel from the hotel every night to have a, a towel to shower with when you get to the building all the top guys and then wcw had these marriott towels and me and steve would show up with this you know thread barren you know shit towel that we had stole from some 19 dollar a night motel we stayed at the worst hotels we could find, and we rented the shittiest goddamn cars. And I remember one time oh. we had rented a Chevy Corsica. Now, I'm going to tell the, the Mazda 929 story in a minute, but we were rented a Chevy Corsica, and you was driving. And I didn't hardly let anybody drive me on the road because I just didn't trust anybody. But you were always a good will man, still are. And we were coming around a corner in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in a Chevy Corsica. And you was kind of all an ass, and that road was kind of grooved up. That somebody started skipping around the house, skipping across the road. And I just looked at you, and I remember saying this damn near verbatim. I said, "Dude, I think you got you might have a little bit more confidence in this shit box than I do." I said, well, "Won't you slow the fuck down?" You remember that shit? Oh, uh, fuck! It was white with fucking red interior. Damn man. right. <laughs> And then after after about six, nine months of that shit, we thought we hit the big time one time, and we made reservations on a Mazda 929. You remember that shit? Picked that son of a bitch up, and then it, it budget, and Marietta came out and picked you up. I mean, we were for the leather set. I think it was the first time we ever had leather seats. <laughs> like a couple of white pimps driving out. But see, now, this is back in the day when the 929 had some fucking stroke, man. If you had a 929, oh, yeah. you was semi-big time. 